Um, and uh, I'm Mark Lutz. Um, I, I work with WWF. Uh, and uh, this event comes at the intersection of uh, two of my main jobs in WWF. Um, I lead our delegation here at the, uh, our negotiations uh, delegation here at the, uh, at the COP27. Um, and we have some of our uh, uh, team here with us. Um, and it's drawing to a close. Uh, Today is the last official day of negotiations, uh, but I, I don't think it'll be actually the last day. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, the items that's being, being negotiated here and seems to be moving forward is uh, carbon markets, uh, which uh, has, has some bearing on uh, the things we're talking about here. Uh, my other my other major job in WWF is coordinating uh, co co facilitating our um, um, WWF uh, carbon finance and markets task force, where we try to come to grips with some of the thorny issues around um, um, offsets and uh, carbon markets and ways corporations can uh, can contribute to um, mitigation activities and nature based solutions beyond their value chain um, and we're we're actively looking for um, for alternatives to traditional offsets approaches and you're going to hear a lot about uh, the, the some of the key ideas we have in in this event so in this event we have let me give a brief introduction to uh, to our panel first we're going to have a presentation from my colleague uh, Juliette de Grand Pre from uh, WWF Germany, who's going to pre present some work uh, that WWF Germany is doing to advance uh, this proposal that we've developed in WWF with WWF, uh, the Boston Consulting Group, and um, and the Science Based Target Initiative around uh, contribution claims. And uh, WWF Germany has done some pioneering work on advancing. Uh, um, this agenda that we're going to hear about here. Um, and then we're going to hear from uh, a panel um, and give some uh, feedback on this and respond to uh, have a more general discussion about uh, the potential for this approach. We have <clears throat> with us here um, on, on the stage, Martin Kamis, um, who's the head of uh, the Energy and Climate Division of OICO Institute. Welcome, Martin. And online, we have um, uh, Robert Hoagland from uh, Melky Wire, who's working with the um, Climate Transformation Fund, who uh, is, seems is doing some similar uh, kind of thinking and work. And we also have Jessa Schoenberg, um, who's the head of research and consultation with uh, Foundation Development and Climate Alliance. Um, and we will invite you to. You, Welcome to give a bit, a bit more uh, background on yourselves and your work uh, when we get to uh, the panel discussion. But first, we're um, uh, we're going to hear from uh, from uh, Juliet, who's going to give us a presentation on the work WF Germany is doing on uh, on contribution claims. So, take it away, Juliet. Thanks a lot, Mark. Let me share my screen. So I hope it looks good on your end as well. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, thanks a lot to the speakers, Mark, and the public for being here. I will be presenting a report that we just published this morning with some recommendations for companies on how to do beyond value chain mitigation through the contribution model. There are three reasons why an alternative model to offsetting is needed in our view. First, we see a high demand for offset. 20% um, of the largest 2000 companies worldwide have set a net zero target, but these targets vary widely in quality. So we see um, very different uh, interpretation of net zero, um, different gases being covered, uh, scopes being covered, different interpretation on what the role of offsetting and removals play in these strategies. Second, we see a low environmental integrity of offsets. So this is uh, from a study being uh, published by a new climate uh, at the beginning of the year. 
uh, looking at offsetting strategies of, of big companies. And I mean, we have seen, we have had lots of unresolved issues on offsetting in the past on additionality, permanence, leakage, and definition, definition of baselines. Um, and it has always been our position not to fund forest and land use projects to the carbon markets because there can be no fungibility between um, a, car, a credit from a fossil avoidance project and a reversible forest project. So we, we were always the opinion that we need another solution to fund, to fund these projects. And we have another difficulty with the Paris Agreement um, with double claiming or double counting. And we see that uh, this is unresolved in 99% of the case on the voluntary carbon markets. And third, of course, we see there is a high funding needs for nature-based solutions. So it is clear that we need additional funds for these projects. And we also see that there is a very high demand for forest and land use projects from the private sector. So my second point is there is an increasing pressure through lawsuits and campaigns on companies to review their strategy if it relies on offsets. So I have a, a few um, examples in here. Uh, Greenpeace uh, sued against Shell for labeling its petrol as carbon neutral. This was judged misleading by the Dutch advertising code. In Germany, we had similar cases uh, with the climate neutral chicken of a German supermarket chain, which was withdrawn after a campaign by Foodwatch. Um, there is also a lawsuit of the NGO Environmental Action Germany against several companies labeling their products climate neutral, such as car driving or flying. And really, we only saw one good example of, um, of uh, advertising, which is Herklofs with this advertisement we are not climate neutral, but we had to cheat to get there. I will start my presentation with a bit of context. So as Mark said in his introduction, we published um, the Beyond Science-Based Target Blueprint for Corporate Action on Climate in Nature in uh, 2020, where we basically recommended the following for companies for the, uh, to set a robust uh, uh, climate strategy. First, accounting and disclosing all emissions, including scope three. Second, focusing on the mitigation hierarchy through a science-based target. And three and four, in which we recommended a new approach for remaining emissions, not going through offsets, but pricing remaining emissions to define the proper financial commitment for our company. And then investing the financial commitment in climate projects climate innovation, and also climate advocacy. For climate projects, we published a second document, which is called Beyond Calm Credits, a blueprint for high quality interventions that work for people, nature, and climate, which I will talk a bit, a bit later in my presentation and which was also presented at a side event yesterday. So there, not all questions were answered in the WF PCG blueprint. And as we presented the concept to companies the last two years, um, companies asked us about uh, how to quantify exactly this financial commitment by pricing uh, remaining emissions and their questions turned around which emissions and which CO2 price. And also the second question were, where to invest the financial commitment. Here we define three categories in this new study, climate projects, climate innovation, and climate advocacy. The first step covers the quantification of the financial commitment. So we knew that pricing directly 100% of scope one, two, three emissions can be a too high burden for companies. That is why we propose a phase-in approach according to which companies should start with the pricing of total scope one and two emissions, introduce a shadow CO2 price for all scope three emissions and start to price scope three emissions only after 2030. And companies can also deduct value chain emissions that are already covered by a regulatory CO2 price scheme or originate from a company having a science-based target or following a similar climate finance approach. So we think that this kind of rebate possibility will allow companies to price scope three emissions after 2030, because then 
until then they will try to um, to involve their suppliers in in this model or in SPT. Which CO2 price? So we had lots of debates on this. This really took a, a while to, to come to, to the best solution, which, um, which should be the reference carbon price, should be the social price of carbon. And um, the German Environmental Authority has published some recommendations on the social price of carbon that you can see here. So of course, we know that pricing uh, emission with this relative high calm price can be too large burn for companies. So the general guidance should be um, to, to have a starting carbon price uh, uh, in line with the local price. Um, if there is one in the countries, in any way, our recommendations should, um, should is that companies should introduce the social price of calm gradually start with a CO2 price of 100 euros and increase it gradually to, to 290 by 2030. As an option, companies can cap the total value available for climate finance investment. There has been some proposals on this in the past from uh, different actors. And in any case, the carbon price should be referenced and justified transparently. The second step, makes a recommendation on where to invest the financial commitment for companies. And here we list three categories, climate project, innovation, and advocacy. So I will go through them quite quickly. The first category focuses on climate projects. Um, and on this, the SPTI published a blog post a few months ago on activities qualifying for beyond value chain mitigation, such as renewable energy, energy efficiency, removals. And two categories are especially interesting in the context of the contribution model. It's forestry and conservation approach because car markets and offsetting are not the right tools to finance nature-based solutions, but the contribution model is. And we have summarized all important guidelines for high quality interventions in this blueprint. And two of the key principles of these publications are that uh, nature-based solutions should unlock climate finance at landscape level rather than at project level. That's a really important recommendation. And the second is that projects should focus equally on climate, uh, people, and nature, and not just on carbon, which uh, carbon markets have done very much in the past. Some examples um, of climate projects are listed here. There's many other examples. And um, in the report we published today, there is more um, details on them. So it's the WF Saba Living Landscapes Program in Malaysia, Landscape Resilience Fund, or the WF Forest Forest Program. The second category in where on where to invest the financial commitment focuses on climate innovation. So there are areas in global climate change mitigation that need technological innovation. We know that, but we already had seen lots of technological innovation. And there is also a variety of technologically robust solutions that are not being applied consistently. And to change this, uh, we also need commercial and institutional innovation because it helps to remove barriers for scaling. So in the report, we have also have listed more criteria on this because we don't think that all climate innovate or all innovation can be financed through the system. But um, I've listed here some examples, technological innovation. We've listed here the climate kick network, institutional innovation, the behavioral of change um, campaign through WFPNG and commercial innovation, the climate solver program of WF India. The third category on where to invest the financial commitment focus on climate advocacy. And in the blueprint, in the corporate climate mitigation blueprint, there was um, on the bottom, there was this influence climate policy in own sector and beyond. And this is pretty clear that to achieve the global net zero target, a, a strong regulatory environment is essential to incentivize companies to reduce their emissions. And that is why we think that businesses should use this tool to protect this climate, uh, their influence on policy and political actors through initiatives, through associations, through participation in public actions. And 
we think that it should be possible for companies to use this budget uh, to finance those actions. And some examples are here listed here. We've, um, we've listed the platform for advocacy, the MiltiWire. We, I'm sure we, we will hear more later. The lo lobby transparency initiative in Europe, some political campaigns we are still in, and the Swiss Business Association, Swiss Clean Tech. So as a summary, we support the operationalization of contribution claims with this new publication. And the contribution model is really a paradigm shift from the classical offsetting approach of ton for ton finance to a money for ton finance approach. The goal, the mechanisms and the claims as well evolve accordingly. In the contribution model, it is not possible to claim uh, carbon neutrality. And the new claim has to go along the lines of the companies on track to achieve its SBT prices, remaining emissions at X euro, and thus finances additional climate protection and other cool benefits. We have made all these recommendations in this new study you can see here, which looks like this. And it's in German, but we have also published a, a, a summary in English. And I'm now looking forward to hearing reactions by our speakers, Giza, Martin, and Robert. And thanks a lot to my colleague, Mark, also for the moderation. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet, for that uh, presentation. Um, so there's a lot in there. There's a lot of uh, content there to unpack. Uh, so um, hopefully we can explore some of the implications of this uh, in our panel now. Um, and I'm going to go around through the panelists with uh, um, two rounds of questions. Um, so first for, for Jessa, um, your foundation has a lot of uh, companies, uh, both sides, companies and offset suppliers of supporters. So we're interested in hearing what they're what they're telling you. Do, on the company side, do they see see classical offsetting increasingly as a reputational risk, um, and are they keen on finding some alternative? And and from the offset supplier side, how how do offset suppliers react to the uh, to the contribution model? Thanks, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And of course, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks a lot for the great presentation, Juliet, and of course also for your new guidelines. Um, so our foundation has about 1,300 so-called supporters that are mainly companies, that's about 70%. We have around 25 offset suppliers working with us together. And we also have some other actors within our network. So um, regarding your question, so we started actually last year with some kind of first um, events introducing this kind of new model, the contribution model. We invited some pioneers in this field, some kind of first movers, Robert was one of them, by the way. And so, but last year, my perception was like, um, there was relatively modest interest in this new concept specifically from the side of companies, there was rather skepticism. What is this about? Is this more a donation? They just didn't, didn't get the idea. So it was just too academic, I would say. So, but, but, but this has changed considerably. So in the last 10 to 12 months, I would say, and Juliet already um, introduced some of the um, critical concerns about the claim of climate neutrality. But this is something also from company side, I would say, um, they are now more on alert. So we have these lots of lawsuits in Germany um, regarding the intransparent use of um, climate neutrality claims. So we have a more critical perception uh, from the public. So consumers are very concerned, etc. So companies these days see a huge, not all of them, but quite some see huge reputation risk coming together with this climate neutrality claim, coming together with this uh, classical offsetting. So this is what, what we observed. And also from the side of the um, offset suppliers, it's kind of the same. 
We had last year some first movers who already introduced con the contribution models. The majority was rather skeptical, but this also has changed. So actually what we are doing now in our foundation, um, we started a project um, together with Wuppertal Institute where we try to uh, develop this contribution model in a way that companies will be hopefully able to use it in the future. But I can tell a little bit more about that later, if you like. OK, thank you. And great to hear that uh, things are changing, seems uh, fairly quickly over the past year. Um, so we'll come back to you. Um, but uh, Martin, uh, here with me on the stage, um, uh, you, you have a long history with carbon markets. Um, how do you see the contribution model? And you think it's an alternative to address some of the concerns about carbon markets, such as non-permanence of nature-based solutions and uh, double counting? Yeah, thank you, um, first of all, for inviting me and uh, also for even more for um, the guide, which uh, WF published today. I think it is really um, the question or this guide was, was linger or was needed since long and, and I think it really fills a gap which uh, was there for quite a while like two three or four years because the idea is was established um, much much earlier and discussed but now uh, I think we have the clear guidance uh, thank you very much for this um, before answering to the question I still have two two remarks maybe um, one is um, I think what I wanted to underscore is is only slightly touched is also that the applicable price, um, um, Juliet mentioned it, that it also provides um, incentives for identify the mitigation options within the companies. Uh, so it's not only to determine what is the budget for um, climate finance, but it also steers um, and the, the um, seek, uh, seeking for uh, options in the company. And I think uh, that is most, I think it's even more important than the uh, climate finance part of that. And therefore, I'm also a little bit uh, reluctant to using the um, uh, term contribution claim. I think the whole discussion started with something which we call at this time uh, responsibility, climate responsibility. And uh, in my view, this puts a bit more emphasis on, 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 uh, on the uh, mitigation part of, of, of this concept, nevertheless. And then, then the second point um, is on nature-based solutions. Um, I, um, I come back to that in a minute, but uh, first on, on the term, I'm, I would say there are no such things as solution if you talk about the climate crisis. So, and um, nature-based is, is important and I agree with that and it should be enhanced and, and, and be, um, yeah, contribute, contribute. So here I would say, uh, it is a contribution to um, to what we all need uh, to achieve to avoid the climate crisis. But I would refrain from using the word solution. I think it was perhaps established by intention also, but it's not a, sol a solution. It's uh, it's a contribution. So coming back to the question, um, whether um, the contribution or responsibility claim really addresses some of the concern of the carbon markets. I would say they don't go away because at the same time uh, we have uh, credit projects and we have the same challenges as far as they are used for offsetting um, in uh, mandatory schemes or by other by, by certain companies uh, we still have the issue of double counting but uh, with the different claim be it responsibility or be it contribution claim we of course get a different focus as well and also, if we do have a, um, a contribution claim, we don't want to have uh, that the money which we invest um, is just not additional or used in projects which are non-additional, um, is, is not uh, double counted and so forth. But since it's often is very difficult to 100% uh, determine whether that a project is additional and is not double counted, I think we can stay a bit uh, or be a bit more relaxed if it's a contribution claim. So uh, it's not a clear, it's, it's in German, we would say it's a yain. It's yes and no at the same time, basically. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Martin. Uh, and I, I like the term nature-based contributions. Uh, we'll, we'll think about that. And uh, this is uh, uh, 
uh, where we've noted that uh, in the current uh, cover text uh, here in the the term nature-based solutions uh, is there for the first time, maybe for the first time in the UNFCCC context, but we'll we'll see how that plays out. So turning to um, Robert Hoagland, um, Robert, um, um, what kind of companies um, come to you and, uh, and what are they looking for in terms of in, in this area of uh, beyond value chain uh, um, contributions and, and uh, uh, and and any any um, uh, first any observations about uh, Juliet's presentation and this work uh, welcome as well. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thank you for following up on this very important report that was released in, in 2020. And uh, so, what we're doing with this climate transformation fund is also explicitly building on a WWF and BCG blueprint. Uh, we're encouraging companies to follow it and have created a charitable fund to try to deal with the fourth step uh, in, in these recommendations, how to finance climate action. Uh, and it's a charitable fund that companies donate to. Uh, and then Milky Wire supports projects that are needed to reach global net zero, trying to identify which are the most effective projects, uh, sort of most in need of funds that we can support to help reach global targets rather than just corporate targets and also looking at from a long-term perspective. So then it's both durable carbon removal, investing in new solutions that hardly exist today, exist in the lab. Some companies are starting to make first deployments. So there's a need for uh, early buyers to help, help catalyze that. Then restoring and protecting nature and then decarbonization, both including and new technologies, but also advocacy and policy. So we have been supporting several organizations working with advocacy and, and policy projects to try to bring about change. And several groups have identified this as often the most effective way of bringing uh, about change with your donations. Uh, so, so that's how it's designed. And so we, we work with a number of companies, uh, Klarna, the Swedish uh, fintech payment providers, uh, the biggest that was with us from the start in uh, early 2021. And they also explicitly follow the WWF blueprint, have adopted an internal carbon fee. It's $100 for scope one, two, and their travel emissions, and $10 for rest of scope three. So I was a little bit concerned when I saw weight with scope three, because there is a lot of possibility with especially companies that have low emissions to actually pay more than just for their scope one and two emissions. And I do see that it could be a risk for actually ambitions to be lowered if you said just use this for your scope one and two emissions, especially since a lot of companies have like 95 and 99 percent sometimes of their emissions in scope three. So the, the total contribution might be very, very low today uh, if it's just scope one and two. And I also uh, published a report just on Wednesday uh, together with Carbon Gap at NDO uh, in Europe looking at what companies can pay for climate and what how should recommendations be different between different companies. And we could see that the companies with the lowest emissions have the highest ability to pay and the lowest ability to use the money internally to reduce their own emissions. So a high emitter have low profits per ton, so to say, and can only use a small amount on external projects, but they have huge abilities to, to use it internally. So I think it's really helpful to also show that the companies is like not one group that like we need to have different recommendations with different types of companies but the rich companies so to say with uh, high profits per ton they emit they can implement a high carbon tax hard high carbon fee for all of their emissions in scope one to three and use that money to uh, to fund solutions so to answer your question it is kind of more those companies than that we are uh, talking to it's not the high emitters it's a uh, more companies that are in, in, in finance or in software or in consulting um, or in, in sort of non-material businesses, because they are also the ones that can pay um, and, and can kind of go forward with this. And another, I think, defining trait is, is companies that are a bit brave, that want to try to, to do new things. Maybe they do it in their regular business model like uh, and, and are, want to take the next step. They realize that there's a lot of uncertainty around if carbon credits have, have been uh, delivering what they promised and, and they want to, they're ready to, to, to move ahead. So, yeah, brave brave companies with um, with lower emissions than, than the sort of world average, I would say. Great, thanks. Um, it's good to hear this is getting a foothold somewhere, uh, even if we haven't broken through into the uh, the real high emitters yet. Um, but but uh, that, that can come uh, perhaps. 
Um, so that's uh, the first round. Uh, we'll have one more round of questions, uh, one more round of questions for the panel. And then uh, I think we're doing fairly well on time. So we should be able to open it up uh, after that to questions from the uh, from the participants here. So uh, I don't know if we have a chance for questions online, but may, maybe we'll, uh, um, I don't know how that works. So we'll uh, go with questions from the, the group here in the room. Um, so, so think about that while we're going through the second round here. So um, uh, mo moving back to Jessa. Jessa, um, we're hearing um, some, uh, some examples of companies that are already buying, buying into this. Uh, and uh, where we're seeing in WWF, the challenge is to bring this to scale and make it really uh, um, get it to the scale where it can really um, uh, be a convincing alternative, uh, kind of mainstream alternative uh, and to, to uh, traditional offsetting approaches. So um, in your view, what's necessary to, to really uh, operationalize the contribution model? Um, and how do you think the proposals presented today can contribute to, to the discussion? Okay, ah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I think what we actually need is something, first of all, like a new powerful narrative for this new model. So at the moment, we're still are talking about contribution claims or beyond value chain mitigation, etc. So that makes sense in a way, but for companies, this is just not really something they would like to run after in a way. So I think there's something we really need to develop. So let, let's see. And together with this new narrative, of course, we need to somehow um, make some things clear on the um, other steps which, which need to be done as well. So we have to see which actually which kind of project we would like to support with this new model. Is it still the kind of classical projects of, from the voluntary carbon market? Or are we going beyond these kind of projects? We need to specify criteria yeah, criteria with at least the same high quality standards or even above the standards of the voluntary carbon market, etc. So we need to bring these different things together or we would say the different dimensions together and out of this, we can hopefully uh, create a new narrative and then out of the narrative, we can create a new claim, which is kind of um, for uh, something for our corporates to use. Um, how to really operationalize this. Um, we have already some good examples. We just saw uh, or got some, some insights here. Um, but for scaling, I think we need to try to bring together as many stakeholders as possible to develop this together. Because at the moment, we already see a kind of fragmentation in the market. So offset uh, suppliers already start to make their own kind of concepts, models of something like a contribution model. So we really need to hurry up to bring these ideas together. Otherwise we might even have a more fragmented market than we already have this, with the climate neutrality claim. So, and this is, as I uh, said in the beginning, this is something we also would like to try uh, together with different stakeholders in the, with our foundation to bring ideas together, integrate concepts from corporates and out of this to really come up with an idea, which is something uh, which, what works in the end. Thank you. Thanks, um, a good challenge for us to uh, put our heads together and think about how to move this ahead before others get out ahead of us, I think with the ideas perhaps that uh, we wouldn't necessarily uh, I agree with. Um, so that I think some of the issues you raised feed into the next question I have for Martin. Um, Martin, how, how can we measure impacts uh, using the contribution model? Is uh, the current uh, currency used in uh, the carbon markets and carbon credits approach the only way to measure impacts? Or, or can we uh, work, uh, work out a way to use the contribution model without um, the kind of traditional carbon credits? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, maybe the answer is also twofold. To some extent, it's on the uh, yeah on the contribution, uh, how to measure the impact, but on the other hand, it's also how valid is the, the the claim of the company. And for this regard, I would say that at least the applicable price really used by the company is an indication on on their how much responsibility they take, and and the higher the price. Um, the more responsibility I think uh, the companies take. And so, so uh, this is, is one part of, of the measurement. 
But then, of course, uh, how should the money uh, of the responsibility budget be spent? And uh, to some extent, I think we, of course, can uh, use um, um, the approaches. But um, since uh, Juliet already explained that we will have, have new types of projects, for example, innovate, innovation projects or projects who um, support new innovation, I think we need to develop uh, new methodologies, which are in the structure similar to the ones we uh, know from the carbon market from, from CDM. But just as an example, I think Gold Standard already developed a methodology for carbonatization of, of concrete. Uh, so where you uh, use concrete to capture CO2 from, from ambient air. And they have developed a, a, a methodology how you can monitor and measure that. And that could be an approach which would be needed for other types of um, innovative technologies as well. But I think the work has just started and, and, and that's a lot further work uh, we need to initiate there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, turning um, to Robert Hoagland again. Um, Robert, um, uh, how does Melk Melky Wire clarify issues around the quality and impact of, of interventions and how, how do you ensure both um, quality and, uh, and impact? What, and what role do you see, do you see for credit like certification uh, and those kinds of things? Um, uh, and how do you, how do you deal with uh, what you might come across uh, the classical offsetters argument of uh, with us you know exactly what you get for a euro? Thanks. Yeah, with classical carbon credits, you know how many carbon credits you're going to get, but you have no idea what impacts you're going to get, and that's been proven in investigation after investigation. Uh, last now in Australia with the forest program, there was. Uh, um, the people behind it sort of went out and said it, it didn't work uh, just the last in a long row what we're doing is um, and not not saying carbon credits is uh, it's always bad of course but um, it, it's just that you don't have the same certainty there's certain a lot of high quality carbon credit products as well but what we do when we look at uh, products is that we go out and look broadly within these three categories durable carbon removal nature restoration and protection and then decarbonization advocacy policy we're going to publish a request for proposal uh, later this year in December uh, for the third round of selection of projects. And we have created a number of criteria for each of this, uh, uh, this section, looking at things like the, the catalytic effect of our support, um, the ecological and the social sustainability, uh, the chance of this project happening, additionality, of course, durability, uh, and also the systematic uh, system effect. What, what happens if you move things around, taking biomass from one place and, and turning it to uh, a carbon storage? Is that the most the best use of that biomass? And trying to you know look at it from, from multiple angles, uh, putting a grade on, on each of these criteria, and then taking an input from an advisory group. Uh, and also... Um, looking at actors like Giving Green that have spent 6,000 hours on looking at how to best use funds for uh, donations to, to climate. And, and they're also in, in our advisory group and a lot of other experts. So really being humble with that we don't know exactly what the impact is going to be. And we have to look at things like the expected value. And especially if you support advocacy and policy, um, a lot of those products don't achieve their full obje objective. But still, uh, if, in the long run, it has been proven that supporting effective organizations that, that do this work uh, is the thing that, that pays off the most. But it's also because uh, you don't have this certainty that you also can't make a claim. Uh, and I think it's, um, of course, a lot of companies are used to, to having a label for their actions and saying we're climate neutral, etc. But I don't think we should try to replace that. The way you communicate your contribution claim, in, in my opinion, is that you say we have contributed this amount of dollars to these projects selected on this basis. And that's the claim. Because that's the simple truth. That's what you've done. You don't need to say anything else. Maybe you can say something about like, and therefore we're a responsible company or something. But yeah, we, we can think about claims like that. But I don't think we have to complicate it and replace carbon neutral with, with, with something else. Um, and um, But of course, like there's a need to, to work together and, and have 
um, ways of thinking of how these then products can be evaluated later on. How do you know if a advocacy product was successful? Of course, the nonprofit world with uh, WWF <laughs> doing most of its, I mean, doing all of your work on, uh, on changing the world uh, without selling carbon credits, like you, you know all about that. So uh, it's, it's the same as, as funding you. Um, we are also working with Gold Standard or going to start work with Gold Standard on, on uh, to, and together with others as well on finding new ways to, to also evaluate after the fact on how these kind of products are going, but also working on common principles for how uh, how products can be selected. So it's not just something that one actor develops, but it can have um, more common things. And yes, I want to comment on one more thing that Martin said about the, the higher the price, the, the, the more the responsibility. And I agree to some extent, but then you also have to look at the difference between companies and you can look at something like a share of profit or a share of revenue. And it's also in this carbon gap report that, that I mentioned where Delta Airlines, for example, only had $5 per ton. Uh, that they spent, but they spent half of their profits in 2021. It was uh, by far the company that like spent most of the revenue and profits in, in sort of in a relative sense. Not that they necessarily spent it on on the best projects. Like I don't know for sure, but uh, it's just an interesting comparison of where a dollar per ton and a share of revenue and share of profit might look radically different depending on what company you're looking at. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have, uh, I can see lots of room for collaboration uh, between uh, between the, the various organizations involved in this discussion uh, going forward. Um, so now we have a few more minutes. Uh, I think we have another like 10 minutes or so. So uh, let's open it up to any questions um, that, that you folks have here. Um, uh, and maybe we'll collect maybe the first three questions and ask the panel um, to respond to uh, to any uh, any of them uh, you want, so um, okay. If if you want to go first, go ahead. Sure. And, uh, say your name and organization. Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Um, my name is John Lewis. Uh, I wear two hats: the NGO that observes here Pro Natura, Brazilian French NGO, and a series of dare I say, nature-based solution credit companies that have been working. And this first one, Terra Global Capital in the voluntary space. The new one is being developed uh, for carbon futures in the agricultural uh, carbon credit context, because of course, you've got to have the futures because the change, the land use change and the agroforestry aren't there yet. Um, but we're being pushed off a cliff in a sense by the investment community in Wall Street, which doesn't read long reports. They've never mentioned any of these reports. In fact, I've never heard of them. And although I hang out at WWF Washington where I live as a USAID retiree, but what they're groping with in a vague sense and the Securities Exchange Commission is wrestling with is um, that, you know, normally when a company that they invest in makes a lot of money, the shareholder value goes up. And when they don't make as much money, the shareholder value doesn't go up as much. And when they lose money, the shareholder value goes down. And we heard about how things have changed in the last year and a half. And, you know, I think, I don't know, but I've never heard this uh, from the groups that have green in their name, like Bloomberg Green, but the Securities Exchange Commission guys back at the club say that, uh, you know, oil, cement, mining companies are making more money than ever, but that hasn't triggered a rise in their shareholder value like it used to. So there's some sort of mysterious thing where you have a heavy footprint. Uh, and no matter how much money the company makes, the stocks are not going up. So BlackRock and Goldman Sachs are competing with each other to fix that. And fixing that, of course, is offsetting it, but offsetting it with a word I haven't heard yet. And I know the word is being, you know, pushed back here, co-benefits. So 
how do you get these credits and make money getting them and so on and so forth. And, uh, but what I'm asking is, has that study been done? So we have three variables, footprint, shareholder value, profits. Have they been algorithmized in a study that I so I guess uh, the question is, how does um, taking runs of responsibility for your emissions through either offsetting or some other uh, beyond value chain interventions affect shareholder profits? Um, okay, uh, thanks, go ahead. Yeah, um, good morning. My name is Florian Eichold from uh, Atmosphere. Um, I have a question for Martin. Um, we are working on the alignment of the business model which was offsetting basically with the Paris Agreement. And we have been working closely with the colleagues here also to enter the business of uh, the contribution claim activities. And now we have heard about uh, supporting nature, um, let's say it like this, um, but there are still many mitigation opportunities that have to be covered. So I would like to hear from you, um, what, what is the share of money that should go to mitigation um, or activities or um, sequestration activities? Hey, thanks. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question. Sam, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Sam Van Plus. I'm with Carbon Market Watch in Brussels. Um, I have... Um, one comment and one question, if I may, I'll try to be brief. And congratulations to WWF for presenting this. I think the the paradigm shift, as Juliette outlined it eloquently, is is uh, is crucial here. Moving away from the ton to ton old school Kyoto approach to to something which which drives mitigation action uh, without without claiming you become carbon neutral today. And and we've seen a lot of initiatives with with very limited credibility to be honest um my my comment is on the current negotiations we are looking at article 6.4 text uh, in the wee hours of the morning uh, it's interesting to see that there is actually a notion there now of uh, mitigation contribution uh, units i think that the acronym will be horrible because it's going to be something like mca 6.4 but well, well we can improve it what we are worried about right now is um that on the the side of the claims there will be no guidance given coming from the unfccc so um, the units are there, uh, they are called contribution units, but any any voluntary actor could still take them uh, and claim carbon neutrality on that basis. And, and I think there should be broad agreement here, at least in this in this room and virtually that that's not the way to to use such credits and uh, uh, claim claim net zero today, um, so to say. My question is on the uh, accounting for the regulatory ETS uh, systems. Um, keeping in mind that globally countries are not putting forward yet nationally determined contributions to keep us in line with what's required, why would you fully exempt all those emissions as soon as they are under a compliance system because they don't necessarily keep track with the required emission reductions. Uh, also, some of them, for example, the EU ETS has more than 40% of all the emission allowances handed out for free. So they come nowhere near to the carbon price signal um, supported by WWF here. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so over to our um, uh, panel um, to respond to any or all, all of those. Uh, who wants to jump in? Um, and uh, Juliet, of course, you're welcome uh, to jump in along with the other panelists. Any yeah. views? Yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can answer a few of the questions, uh, starting with Sam's question. So, yes, it's true that we propose this uh, kind of rebate for scope three emissions uh, that follow, that have this regulatory price, such as the ETS price, and the ETS price is, uh, is not at the level of 1.5 degree uh, because the ETS um, well, because the EU target is not high enough. So that's true. But um, what we propose in this guidance, and these are just recommendations, of course, is um, basically to, to, to switch, to shift to the contribution model and a phase-in approach. So we propose a phase-in for 
for um, for phase three emissions, and we propose a phase in for the price, knowing that ideally companies would uh, phase in scope three tomorrow with the social cost of carbon, but knowing that this is just not realistic. So we have made a lot of, uh, we have had a lot of discussion. These uh, proposals were, dis um, were made by WBF uh, Switzerland and Germany. And it, it was all about how can we make this model work and what is realistic for companies. And as Robert said, I mean, there is no, there's not two similar companies, right? So the emissions profiles are very different from one company to the other, but we had always in mind companies emitting a lot. So we don't, you know, we don't just want to have service companies or startup companies, but we want to have the big companies uh, with a big chunk of emissions. And we tried to make that work. And I think these recommendations on the price and phasing in, um, phasing in emissions they have to be adapted from one company to the other because, of course, the, as I said, the emissions profile very, very uh, greatly from one company to the other. And um, just a second, just a um, com comment for atmosphere. Um, so we had a, I, I presented a focus on a forest conservation project. That's true. Um, it's just because we think there is, um, we, all along we thought that the carbon markets were not the appropriate way to finance this project. But we think that in the contribution model, we can't fund this project at last. So that's what we had a focus, but it doesn't mean that we don't uh, favor uh, investment in other projects. So uh, in CDR or in, in re renewable or efficiency. And also, I don't think there is such a, a, um, a mitigation versus removals debate. I think we need both and we need mostly mitigation. So we see conservation projects in uh, a forest conservation project also as mitigation thing, not just removals. We actually say you need to protect existing forests before you start uh, uh, sinks, building up sinks. You actually, the, the biggest priority is to stop deforestation. Thanks, Juliet. Um, Martin? Yeah, uh, perhaps I can, can, can add to this. Um, actually, I think uh, you answered the question I was asked, and uh, I fully agree with the answer. I just wanted to add, so um, you mentioned in your report as well that the, the, the shares um, uh, of the different um, mitigation or removal technologies or approaches uh, need to maybe need to develop uh, at a later stage but i think that also depends on 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 we are on the voluntary market on 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 the companies or the the those who uh, want to uh, claim their responsibility and some have a preference for innovative approaches and then they would put all the money into just one other think it's it's important to have a portfolio and put uh, different shares to different approaches so i think uh, that is something where I'm a bit relaxed right now, and I think where uh, over time uh, um, a certain practice will develop. And uh, um, but I agree with uh, Juliet; we need all approaches, and so it's good if uh, some money goes in into all of them. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any other responses from the panel? Are we go for another round of questions? Um, so, any other questions? Uh, any quick questions? Where? Quickly running out of time. Go ahead. Yeah, um, one one question uh, regarding the timeline and the transformation. How fast do will we get from the Kyoto narrative to the new um, uh, model that was proposed here? Um, I I think the Aita Pavilion is close uh, by. There is business around um, uh, carbon credits. Uh, it's millions going on in into projects uh, that create offsets, and um, and w w it, uh, there are still free seats here. So I think we are a very few people uh, interested in this uh, change. Um, uh, so how long will it take until the majority of money go in, 
in a transparent way to high quality projects through this transparent approach. Okay, there's a challenge for all of us. Um, that's a, a good closing question, I think. If um, if any of you have any um, any uh, responses to that, uh, any uh, crystal ball gazing or um, <clears throat> um, I, strategies I, around this, and uh, at the same time, if you want to make any closing comments, and then after this round, we'll wrap it up. Maybe I can start. I think uh, absolutely you're right. It's still a, a niche thing, right? It's uh, not that many that even heard about you could do this. So there is a need to to break the idea that you always have to just offset your missions one to one. And um, many companies have just not imagined that anything else could could be be possible, and they could get recognition for being a good company even if they didn't do that. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work to do. I do think it will be growing. As Gessa said, it, it's seen a lot of change just, just in the last year. We have more companies coming in. We're going to announce something exciting in a, in a few weeks with also other companies uh, looking into this approach. So looking forward to that. Um, and uh, there's a very strong need for the most, the heaviest actor, um, SPTI, non the least. Uh, I was part of the Net Zero uh, advisory group, and we discussed this a lot. And I know they're working on further guidance on beyond value chain mitigation that really incentivizes companies to, to do things before they, they reach net zero. And even though they can't use uh, anything to, to make claims about neutrality or, or net zero before they re reduce their emissions with 90%. So there is a need to incentivize uh, companies. And uh, the more companies that start doing this, uh, the easier it will get for, for others and they can be inspired by their peers and, and start doing it. But I, at the same time, I, I, I would be surprised if uh, the offsetting paradigm would completely go away. So this could be, you know, a, a, maybe competing uh, paradigm for quite some time. That would be my uh, my guess. Thanks, Robert. Who's next? Maybe I can just just go next. Okay. Um, I I fully agree to everything uh, what Robert said, but um. I also think that the uh, classical offsetting will, will be still there, but I really believe that the new model might be able to grow quite quickly uh, to reasons, at least for Germany. I'm just talking about Germany because um, the skepticism about climate neutrality is really growing. So companies are looking for an alternative. And as soon as I start to actually introduce a new concept, at the moment, they're all interested. It's really, it's for me quite fascinating even uh, to, to realize this. And uh, one other comment is, for instance, if we look to our neighbor from German perspective, sorry again, uh, to France. So France is a different, different thing. It's more regulated, et cetera. But there more or less a contribution model is already working in a way. What is also quite interesting to know. So I think there is a chance, not that is only the new model, but the new model could become a real alternative. Thank Thanks. you. Thank yeah, you. I fully agree with uh, Geza, um, and we notice the same. Uh, we ask, are asked questions and uh, what can we do instead of climate neutrality by several companies. So um, there is a mood um, to, to have a different approach to that. And in addition, I think, uh, in the uh, in the EU, we will have an approach which really, um, I think, later this month, um, a, a, a directive or a regulation will be published on how to uh, on 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 re no environmental claims, and that will also put some additional pressures on 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 pressure on companies really um, to to change their communication. So in this context, I think it's a good time that uh, the guidance now is published uh, when there will be demand on that. And last but not least, I think it to some extent depend, it also depends on, on how um, the, um, um, the one approach on, 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 on campaigning, so how that works. If money goes into campaigning, it could be a, a self-increasing um, uh, cycle or trigger at least a self-increasing cycle. Thanks again. I think it's really an important import, uh, report uh, or guidance, and I'm looking forward to uh, what it's um, on the impact of it. Thank you. Thanks. And over to Juliet for the last word. 
Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot to for, to to every everybody. Our press release today was uh, basically focusing on reduction, reduction, reduction. So we know that this is actually not the main task, right? What we talked about today, the main task is to reduce. So that's for sure. And this is just you know the the rest of the task. If you have remaining emissions, you should take responsibility for it, and you should do this at the social price of carbon and not at five dollars, as we saw all along on the VCS. And so we know there are still some questions unanswered in this uh, from this report still because we noted them, and so we're actually quite happy there are other actors are working on this uh, as well. And so thanks a lot to the speakers and thanks to you, Mark, for moderating today. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Juliet and WF Germany, for this amazing work, and thanks to the audience for participating here. Bye-bye. Thank you.